dustbin in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not was we for me he died on Calvary. And mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me. that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty God that God did man at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burden so found liberty at Calvary. Mercy was there. And mercy there was great and grace was free. And pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burden so found liberty at Calvary. Amen. We serve a God who has given us liberty from our burden's heart, from our burden of sin. Y'all can be seated at this time. Hey, uh, it's good to be with you today. Uh, I'm not Ted Danson, I promise you that. <laughs> if, I, if I've had uh, one pe uh, person, four or five, ask me that, and that's something that uh, my wife, Darla, and I, she's, I tell her she's married to a celebrity, but she, uh, but, uh, you know, I have been coming to First Baptist um, uh, every two or three years, four years. Brother Tommy and I are friends from back in Arkansas, and, and, uh, but when I come in, I, people say, now, do I know you? Have you been here before? And I think, boy, I must really, I got to do something different. Then I told my wife, I know what it is. The first time I came, I had a beard. And I had dark hair. And then I came back the next time, I didn't have the beard, I had the dark hair. Then I came back the last time, I had gray hair. And now I'm wearing glasses. So, I mean, listen, uh, there's a reason why Superman, as Clark Kent, wears glasses. So they don't know who he is. So I apologize. I changed my appearance. I didn't mean to. It's just what age does to you. And I, I, uh, I may have the walker the next time. I, I don't know. But, uh, well, this is my wife, Darla, right here. Miss Darla Stan right there. Miss Darla, come on. You're from Texas. Uh, man, this, she's a Texas, she's a Texas lady from, from down in Kilgore Way. And, and uh, she hasn't always been with me. And I'm glad she's here today. And my name is Mark, not Ted, Mark Bailey. And, uh, I like to tell people, for those who don't know me, and there's some, you might start thinking, yeah, I remember that guy a little bit. And uh, we, uh, I started out as a preacher's kid and uh, spent 20 years of my life with my uh, preacher father, mother, one older brother, two older sisters. And uh, as my dad uh, pastored and preached and evangelized, he was someone in evangelism like I do. And, uh, and I started off on a platform at about seven years of age, and next year will be my 60th year. I know I don't look that old, but 60 years somewhere on a platform, somewhere in a nursing home, somewhere at a youth camp, somewhere always uh, being uh, 
uh, singing, having the privilege to sing the gospel and to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I'm very grateful and thankful for my Lord for that. And the last 45, soon to be 46, with Miss Darla. And, uh, and so we're Mark Ministries, and so we, just, we, we travel from church to church. This time, next week, Lord willing, I'll be in, we'll be in West Virginia. And so pray for us as we're, uh, in fact, we're, we're selling some things out in the parking lot for fuel. And uh, if you, uh, we have a we have little, little, little trailer out there. It's pots and pans. And no, no, God will take care of us. He's taking care of us. And so, so our anniversary is next month. And here's the thing. Our anniversary is the day before my birthday. And she did that on purpose. Because she said, you know, if you forget my anniversary or our anniversary, no birthday for you, buddy. No birthday for you. And so, uh, so anyway, I'm, I'm very, very thankful. And just like anybody who's been married a long time, you go through ups, you go through downs, trials and tribulations. But I can tell this, I like to tell young people this, it does get better. It does get sweeter. And you just, there's a bond, there's a connection there. And, uh, and, um, and uh, she almost didn't come today because her mother has been very ill down in Kilgore. And I said, well, maybe you need to just stay in Kilgore. And I'll go up and preach, and I'll come back, and then though it's a little farther out of the way, but she, uh, but she felt she wanted to, to come with me, and I'm glad she did. And so, uh, so that's a little bit about us and what we do. Uh, I always say this every time I come. I, I just appreciate your pastor, uh, Brother Tommy, Dr. Turner, so much. When I moved to Harrison, Arkansas in 1999, Brother Tommy was pastor in Eagle Heights Baptist Church, and um, and. Uh, and so when he talked about coming up here, I'm the one guy that would not give him a recommendation because I didn't want him to leave. And uh, no, I didn't do that. But uh, m- more than just a pastor friend, and I was pastoring there at the time, um, um, Brother Tommy's been a great personal friend. And um, I just appreciate him so much and his family. And so it's an honor to be in his pulpit. I just, I just would like to come sometime when he's here. Uh, but, uh, but they say that's what makes good friends when you live 500 miles apart. I'm not sure about that. Well, listen, today I want to talk to you a little bit about something that I think I, I, I've done for myself. I'm just going to share it with you, and I, I hope that it will help you. But i got a question for you. In the day we live, in the times we live, what is it that we really know for sure? Does anybody out here have a lot of answers? Now, I know if you're saved today... You know Jesus Christ is your Savior. You know you're going to heaven, and, and hopefully you've grown in the faith since your salvation. But as, as we make our way on travels uh, across the country in different churches and organizations and events, and, but what troubles me is among many Christians and even preachers and pastors, uh, and I'm not saying I'm the best at it because sometimes even my, my faith gets shaken, but it seems like that uh, with all that's going on, we don't really understand what's going on. I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. We're going to read a few verses there. Then I want to share with you just some thoughts about what do we know for sure. And see if we can can, uh, answer some questions. 1 John chapter 5. And we're going to begin reading in verse number 11. 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 11. And this is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. This life is in His Son. He that has the Son has life, and he that has not the Son of God has not life. Already we're, we're establishing what I call the certainty of the Word of God. Verse 13, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for this wonderful privilege to be a part of the service today at First Baptist here in Paris, Texas. Thank you for many familiar faces we did see again today. Thank you for some that we both reacquainted ourselves with, and that's okay. Thank you for the new folks, the new faces. And that's what excites me the most about any church is when we see new faces, new folks visiting, and new folks maybe becoming part of the church family. Now, Lord, would you give me the words and the strength and the ability to preach this message this morning? I need your help. I want to say what you want me to say. I don't want to say the things you don't want me to say. 
I want to not be afraid of anything other than, than not doing the, the, the right thing of your word. If someone is not saved, I pray they might be convicted of, sal- of the need of salvation. Or Christians that have become uncertain, unsure. They don't know what to do. Maybe they've kind of went to the middle of the road. And Father, if there's anyone in this world that needs to stand and give an answer of clarity, it's the believers of the, ch- of, of, a, of the great Lord God Almighty. Lord, do what you want. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for the great service already from the, day we, from the moment we walked in today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hey, by the way, thank you for your friendliness. I tell churches as I travel, there's two or three things I think a church needs next to the Word of God. A church needs to be friendly. Darla and I go into churches sometimes and we have to introduce ourselves. And that's okay. But I'll tell you what, we kind of got swarmed today and I want to brag to Brother Tommy, and what a friendly church. And it's really been that way every time. But thank you for the ones who, who were friendly and the ones who uh, come up and said, hey, you, you, you got a Sunday school class? And, they, and they, they guided us to our class, enjoyed the class. Brother Gerald, what a great group of men in the assembly time with Brother Bill. I know Brother Bill still knows my name. Him, you know, him and I, he might be a little older than me. Uh, Bill Kennedy, is that his name? Did I get that right? And uh, maybe not. I call people all kinds of different names, so it don't matter. But, uh, but you know what? At my age, I don't worry about uh, forgetting names when I was younger. And of course, sometimes, to be fair, we're out on the road, and, and when you're a pastor, you, you deal with a lot of names, and people will come up. And you, have you ever done this? And people come up, and they say, hey, good to see you. And you go, yeah, good to see you too. And you turn to your wife and go, I have no clue who that is. You've done that. I don't do that anymore. I'm honest with God and man. Hey, how you doing? I say, I don't know who you are. Well, don't you remember you met me two weeks ago? I said, yeah, I'm okay, maybe I did. I just decided to be honest. It's a a clean feeling. So listen today, if you're trying to hide, don't hide. You know, just, it's just part of life. And um, of course, we went through the COVID experience, so now we blame COVID. That's all we do. We can blame COVID for that. But thank you for the friendliness. And another thing, I I think a church ought to be a church. Can I use the word fun? Joy is okay. Joy is really the biblical word because joy comes from the Lord. But I like fun. In other words, when I come to church, when I see somebody with a smiling face, with a hand reached out, or you can sense in their singing and in their ministering that they enjoy ministering with the Lord, to the Lord, let me tell you what, people are watching. One of the reasons I've been doing what I'm doing for 60 years because I grew up in a generation of preachers, men and women, Sunday school teachers, church people, and, and I have to admit, they were excited about serving God. I mean, and they, they, I watched them sing with joy. I watched them give their offerings and talents with some energy. Now, that doesn't mean we have to, we have to take and just be all excited all the time. The, the, the great evangelist Vance Havner said, the best way to describe church sometimes is somewhere between rigor mortis and the St. Vitus dance. And that's kind of the way it is sometimes. We're in churches where, man, they're bouncing off the walls. That's okay. And then we go into some churches sometimes, and, well, it's like they, they think a, a person died in one church we were at, and they called an ambulance, and they carried out seven people before they found the one that died. Now, that's how bad it was. Okay, you'll get that later on, but it's bad. Hey, listen, may, listen, I like to come to a church that's friendly. I like to come to a church that's, well, you see fun, you see joy. And can I give a third one? I think we need to talk about how good God is. Not Yes, we can sing about praise the Lord, and we can preach praise the Lord, but especially in your times of trials and hurts and things you go through, listen, let people know God is good. In our music program that we minister, I sing a song called, Even in the Valley, God is Good. Even in the valley, he is faithful and true. He carries his children through like he said he would. Even in the valley, God is good. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. Now listen, be careful now. If you haven't amen in a while, you might pull a rib. So be careful. Go slow at it. Go slow. You know, and you might catch your hand wanting to go up a little. Be careful. You're in a Baptist church, all right? No, I'm just having fun. I'm having fun with you. Listen, you know what brings, you know what brings friendliness to a child of God? You know what brings joy, what brings uh, the attitude, God's good all the time? You know what brings that? It's the ability to know that God is more than just a name or or a name written in in a book, but you know that he's real and 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 you live your life by him. You, You you have certainty. 
You have conviction. There's a word we don't hear much anymore in churches. You, you, you have a conviction about truth. I heard someone say this one time, the best way to really define your spiritual maturity level, and get this now, is when you have as much joy at the bottom of your life that you do at the top of your life. Did you get that? I mean, hey, listen, if I went to the mailbox and found a $10,000 check from my, my uncle, which I think they're all gone now, so I don't think I'm going to get that. Man, it would be easy to say, well, praise the Lord. Now, to go out there and open up the mailbox and open up the, uh, the pull the lid down and say, uh, this is a letter from the IRS and we forgot, we, you owe us $10,000. Uh, that's a little different story. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be disappointed and discouraged, but we, we should be able to have enough within us to pause and strengthen ourselves. And by the way, that has happened to me through some things in the life, in my past life, through some ministry discrepancies and some, um, my tax prepared, but we worked it out. But I'll tell you what, when I first saw that letter, man, I thought, this is it. I could just see him driving up and hauling me away, you know. But by God's grace, we got it all taken care of, and I'm glad. What do we know for sure? The great preacher, John Wesley, once said, when I was young, I was sure of everything. But after a few years, having been mistaken a thousand times, I was not half so sure of most things as I was before, and at present, I'm hardly sure of anything except, now get this, what God has revealed to me. You know what I love about the ministry of Jesus Christ and the Gospels primarily? When Jesus led someone to him through salvation, when Jesus healed someone, when Jesus casted the devils or the demons out of someone, most of the time Jesus would say, Now, I want you to go home to your friends. Now get this. And sometimes he said, Tell them, but often he said, Show them the good and great things that God has done for you. John Wesley is saying, you know, I'm really not sure of anything, but there's one thing I am sure of. I am sure of what God has done for me. You get a group of Christians, you get a group of preachers, you get a group of believers who they, they uh, realize what God has done for them individually, there's no stopping them. You see, we live in a world filled, and let's see if you agree with me, we live in a world filled with unclear messages. In my lifetime, and I know, I know, I try not to say, young people, forgive us older folks when we say, well, back in my day, you know, back in my day, when, when I was young. But I have a saying that my dad often said, and I'll say it to you young people today, as you are, once I was, as I am, soon you will be. That's a scary thought, isn't it? You mean I'm going to have to look gray and wear glasses and all those things? Yeah, probably. Or you may not have any hair left. Who knows by then? All right. But we live in a world with unclear messages. And right next to salvation, that, that, that we need to know we're saved, my message to the churches have been, well, one message I preach often is don't quit. Man, we just can't quit. In the last 45 years of my ministry, I've went back to several churches I've been at and some new ones, but the sad part in the last couple of years, primarily post-COVID, there's a lot of churches that aren't there anymore. They've closed down. They've shut down. I know, no doubt, First Baptist has felt the effects through the last two or three years. Well, let me tell you something. For the child of God, there's no quit. But here's the thing. What's going to be the catalyst to give you that no quit attitude? You see, we live in a world filled with unclear messages. Now, there was a fellow when I was a young man, teenager, young adulthood, there was a, there was a famous baseball player manager of the New York Yankees, and his name was Yogi Berra. Anybody ever heard of Yogi Berra? And Yogi Berra was a pretty good, pretty good manager. But he was also famous for what they called yogiisms. Now, see, I have dadisms. If you ride with me in a car, you'll be screaming, beating the glass. I love to get my grandkids in the car and start telling them all my grandpa-ism jokes, you know, the, 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 those, those jokes that just you, know, you shake your head at. You want to laugh, but you're just too ashamed to laugh. You know what I mean? Uh, Yogi Berra had some isms. He said, baseball is 90% mental. The other half is physical. He said, nobody gets there anymore. It's too crowded. He said, you got to be careful. You don't know where you're going because you might not get there. He said, you should always go to the other people's funerals. Otherwise, they won't come to yours. And this last one, man, 
I don't know if I, it, it's called an ism, but I sure wouldn't have said it. He said, and there's the time that a lady said to him, good afternoon, Mr. Barra. My, you look mighty cool today. And he said, thank you, ma'am. Yogi replied, you don't look so hot yourself. So uh, I, I wouldn't try that, guys. I just, I don't know. Yogi could get by with it there. But, but those yogiisms really, I use those just to demonstrate they're kind of unclear. They're kind of muddled. And so sometimes things in life right now, all the issues, just, just recently, many and all the Supreme Court decisions, all of the protests, all of the changes in, 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 in the gender discussions and all these things. And I'm telling you, no matter what your view is, and for you that might be watching live stream or, or maybe there's someone here today, you were just brought here today, and I'm not here to try to jam Christianity down your throat. I promise I'm not. In fact, I'm going to tell you the truth. I, kind of almost, I almost got in a debate on Facebook, on my Facebook page, with a conversation of pro-life and pro-choice, and I immediately deleted my comment. And you know why I did that? Because it's not my opinion that matters. You know what matters? It's what God says. It's what God says. And I did share a post on my page, and I basically said, listen, the issues of life are not about my opinion or the conservative opinion or the liberal opinion or the pro-life opinion or the opinion of men. It's what God says. And here's the thing. Either you believe what God says or you don't. Now, I want to say this. Maybe there's someone here today, someone watching, and say, well, I don't believe in God. And let me tell you something. It's not my job to get all mad. I'm not mad at you if you don't believe in God. That's your business. My job as a Christian, my job as a believer, and my job as a preacher of the gospel is to say, but let me tell you what God says. You know what's wrong with the church a lot today? We just won't say what God says. Whether we like it or not, and I quoted Jeremiah 1.5, where it talks about that, that uh, before I was formed, I was in the womb. And I went through John, Jeremiah 1.5, and I went through Jeremiah 139. I'm sorry, Psalm 139, I think verses 13 through 16. And there God himself describes a, a life still inside. He does. I didn't. He describes that life. And he talks about being with that life in the womb. He says, I've even, and I'm, I'm just paraphrasing here, but he said, I even have the blueprints of your, every one of our individual makeup before your parts came together in the womb. Now, I, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a brilliant person. But after reading Jeremiah 1.5 and Psalm 139, you can't, you can't deny God is saying, I'm talking about a life here. But here's the deal, Christians. Let me say you Christians. It's not our job to get mad and get on. I'm just speaking for me. I don't believe my job. Let me put it as my job. I don't believe my job is to get on Facebook and start getting in a 7,000 text debate. You know what I did? I just put on my little, little paragraph on my page, I just, and I kind of, I broke it down. I just put Jeremiah 1.5, and I put Psalm 139, 13, 16, and I said, and there it is. And you that believe that, we're, we're in agreement. And maybe you're reading this, and you don't agree with me. And you think that a, a woman has the right, a mother has the right to let that child live or die. That's your opinion. You do what you want, but I'm still going to tell you what God says because I'm going to, I believe what God says because I believe God created it all and made it all. And you know, and, and, and can I say this, and I have to work on this, it's the tone, it's the anger. I mean, I grew up in a generation of what's called the old hellfire brimstone preachers. Listen, man, I grew up, you, know, you young people, some of you, some of you are my age or older, you know what I'm talking about when preachers used to preach? They said preach the paint off the wall. Man, I went, they went all, wall to wall. Man preaching, the coat had come off. I'm talking about in Baptist churches. I'm just talking about Pentecostal or charismatic. I mean, I grew up around Baptist guys, man. The tie came off, and boy, they got that Bible in their hand. And they said, it don't matter what. That's what the Word of God says. Now, <clears throat> I like what one brother said in Sunday school class this morning. We don't want to compromise the truth, but sometimes we have to adjust our methods. And I think at the same time, as much as I respect my dad and those men of that generation who preached hard and loud and furious, I like what, I like what the Bible says, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. 
So maybe, maybe today, you, you, I don't know what your opinion is on, on any issue. I'm not, I'm not preaching on abortion today. I'm just saying any, any issue. But sometimes things are confusing, and our confusion doesn't always stem from, from what others are saying. Sometimes we get confused for two reasons in this country, in this world. We're busy. We're busier than we've ever been. I know it sounds archaic, but I didn't have to, and I'm going to say this to the young people, I didn't have to deal with all the decisions. I mean, we had three television stations, okay? You've heard that, haven't you? We did. And get this, young people, they were all in black and white. We had no color television. I know right now you'd like to just take and fall out and pass out. How could you live in such a time? Well, it was, it was difficult. No, it wasn't. And basically, in junior high, high school, you either played football and you played basketball, but my own grandchildren now, they have so many options. You, any grandparents agree with me on that? Life is busy. We're working more jobs. Listen, I'm, right now, I, I thank God for some churches that helped me and, along the way, and, but my wife works, and, and I, I, have, I don't always have the suit and tie on. I do a little, little mowing business, and sometimes I have to put on and get on the old zero and, and, and do a little mowing. Now I've got to pay for this gasoline so I can keep the gospel going. And, uh, and whatever else I can do. We're busy. Busyness brings confusion. And I'll tell you, because of that, we have inadequate communication. I've never seen a time. Not only do we not talk to one another, we already don't know how. We don't know how to talk to one another. And when we don't know how to talk to one another, there's problems. Listen to this story. I, I, re- I found a story. It's told of a photographer for a national magazine who was assigned to get photos of a great forest fire. Wanting to take some aerial pictures, he asked his home office to hire a plane. They made the arrangements and told him to go at once to a nearby airport where the plane would be waiting for him. When he arrived at the airport, there was a plane warming up by the runway. He jumped in with his equipment and yelled, let's go, let's go. The pilot swung the plane into the wind and off they went into the air. And immediately the photographer began to say, fly over the north side of the fire, yelled the photographer. Make three or four low-level passes. And the pilot said, why? He said, because I have to take some pictures. I'm a photographer. And that's what photographers do. And after a pause, the pilot said, you mean you're not the flight instructor? Now that's, that's where communication and busyness. You see, did you see the busyness? Did you see the communication? I'm at that place in life. I know none of you folks my age have this problem, but I don't forget things a lot except for where I lay them down. In fact, my, 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 I wore reading glasses, and finally I had, to get, I had to get the real deals. Man, I was amazed. I preached so long with reading glasses, and one day I went, whoa, man, I didn't know people had faces out there. But I do know why God gave us eye problems when we get older, because when I put these things on and looked in the mirror, I did not know that old man looking back at me in that mirror. Confusion. Listen, what do we know for sure? I want to ask you right now. Young people, what do you know for sure about anything? What do you know for sure? Adults? Grandparents? Parents? Americans? What, what do we know for sure? Well, we ought to know something for sure. Because at a time when now the internet and the television screens are filled with competing political advertisements and disagreements about all the issues, all kinds of news reports coming out of Washington about this situation or that situation. Now listen, can I tell you something? I want to just take and take the internets and the televisions and I just want to throw them away. You ever feel like that? Now, let me tell you something. The danger when we start trying to become ostriches and stick our head in the sand, somebody will come along and kick us in the, well, anyway, I don't want to go any farther on that one. Because Jesus didn't say, Jesus didn't say hide. What did Jesus say? He said, let your what? Let your what? Your light shine. You are the salt. If there's one thing I know as a child of God, first of all, this, now, I'm telling you what I know. I'm not trying to tell you what Brother Tommy told me to tell you or anybody. I'm just up here as a man, as a dad, as a grandpa, as a preacher's kid, as a man of God saying, these are the things I'm the thing. If my grandchildren were right here, if my children or my son, I'd be saying, listen, this, this is all I know. Now, I know I'm saved. I know you can know you're saved, and I'll talk about that more in just a minute. But there's some things I know. 
And, uh, and, and I, I, I need to share that optimism, and you do as well. And it's difficult to know what is true and what is false. Well, first of all, we know for sure the Bible speaks with certainty. Now, right now, let me just go ahead and say it. <laughs> if you don't believe the Bible is the Word of God, I don't know what to say. But if you believe the Bible is the Word of God, then I've got news for you. This book, you know why this is a great book? And I can say this now as an older man. When I was saved at a young age and made to stand on a platform at 7, 8, 9 and quote Bible scriptures with the Bailey family singers, yeah, I, I quoted scriptures. And sometimes, even as a young preacher, I'd stand in the pulpit and I'd preach the messages that, well, I know these, this is what needs to be preached because my dad preached it. But at this time in my life, and by the time you get up to a certain age, if what you've been living isn't real, it'll, you'll fizzle out. You won't find the strength to go on. And what makes me go on, first of all, is I know that the Bible, the Word of God is sure. Just, just like John Wesley, we can be sure when God has spoken. Let me tell you something why the Bible is different than any other book or any other communication. The Bible never speaks with timidity. The Bible is never timid. The Bible never says, well, it could be this. The Bible never says, well, it could be that. The Bible never says, well, you know, I, I hope we can make it. That's not the Bible. The Bible speaks with certainty because it is the very Word of God, and God is the Word. That's what John chapter 1 tells us. Now, how did life begin? So here, here we go. How did life begin? That's been the age argument. I think that's a good thing to start with. How did life begin? Now, the world says, and they said it when I was a boy, and they're still saying it, and I think now they're, they're trying to make us really believe it as doctrine, not just a theory. They believe, well, there was this big bang 200 million years ago, and somehow that started an evolutionary chain, and we started out as this tiny blob in a primordial sea, and we evolved into a bigger and bigger blob until finally, here we are. You know, I got to think about evolution. Generally, they say most of those theories, they think we came from apes or monkeys. Now, my understanding of evolution is when something evolves, it leaves what it was and evolves into something else. My question is, why do we still have monkeys? Why do we still have, in other words, if, 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 if we are the descendants of any kind of animal, those animals are still here. So that's really not true evolution. That's just a, just a little bit of a thought I often think about. But you see, they, even to this day, education says, well, we don't know for sure. But let me tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. God created all forms of life in the sea, in the sky, on the earth. And then he reached down and he picked up the basic 16 elements that's in the dirt right outside here in the ground, and he breathed and he, into that, he formed a man, then he breathed the breath of life into that man. And then the woman came from the man. You know the story. If you're not, you need to read Genesis 1, 2, 3, or through there. But here's my point. The world says, man, I don't know where we came from. We could have came from some uh, uh, primordial organism, or we could have, you know, we're looking for that. We're looking for we're looking for that missing link. But when I go to my Bible, <laughs> it's certain. In the beginning, God created, God made. In fact, the Hebrew word is in the beginning, God bara. And here's what makes God great. He created out of nothing. Man creates from the materials God made. God didn't have to have any materials. In other words, my point is, I don't know if I'll ever understand where the universe and the galaxies, my word, here a while back I did a study where, where it talked about the Milky Way galaxy, and it's like millions of miles across. It, it just blows your mind. But you know what? I don't worry about figuring that out. All I know is it's there because God created it. So, so there's a question. How about another question, people? Well, how, well, how do we get into all the mess we find ourselves today? Almost every church I go to, the Sunday school teacher the pastor or some Christian will say, man, I don't, we're in a mess. Now, young people, you don't really realize it, and that's okay, because in fact, I got to thinking when I was a teenager right down at Kilgore, Texas, and I was dating that lady right there, 
in the early 1970s, we had what we called the Iranian oil crisis. And there was gas lines. In fact, they made us, get this, they made us drive our cars 55 mile an hour. So if any of you young people got a Mustang, you're in trouble. You better throttle that thing down. No, so if you, got, you, you, if you went past 55, anybody remember that? Yeah, you had to drive 55. And I remember my dad coming home from the church one day. He'd been studying. He walked in, and he had this som- sober look on his face, this somber look. And he told my mom, he says, you know, gas has went up to 49 cents a gallon. We may have to sell our cars. Now, if my dad was in, I don't know what he'd do now if he was this side of heaven. Of course, I know money's different, things like that. But you know what? It was a real time. Inflation was high then. Things were scarce. And if you go back to my grandparents' age of the 1930s, back when, when the, the great drought, when, the, when God shut up the rain for a long time, and man, nothing would grow. And then Wall Street crashed and the banks collapsed. Can I tell you what came out of that generation? You know what came out of the 1930s and 40s because of all that trouble? We saw more souls saved, greater revivals, and stronger churches and stronger families. Because you know why? Because when God shuts the doors, there's only one way to go, and that's to God. Amen? Now, I'm not saying that has to happen. But see, a little side note here, I don't really worry about global warming and all that because I believe he is in charge of all of that. And if you want to go to your Bible, especially the Old Testament, read the Minor Prophets. The things we see today, pestilence and weather and disease, these three things, shortages and famines, you'll see these three things or four things all through the Old Testament, how God dealt with a rebellious nation and rebellious people who did not want to serve Him. You know, in other words, hang in there. But you say, Brother Mark, what's going to happen? Well, I do know this. If you're saved, you see, I know I'm saved. How do we get ourselves in this mess? Do we realize that some of the, listen, some of the finest minds right now are trying to figure out how to get us out of this mess economically? I mean, we've got politicians. Do we have politicians? I'm sure you've heard the definition of politicians. Polly is many and ticks is bloodsuckers. Now, just what I heard. I don't know if that's... uh, but anyway, no, no offense to any politicians because there's some good politicians. We have sociologists. I read it. We got sociologists. They're trying to figure out. We got psychologists trying to figure out what we're going to do with all the problems. Why has, why has America become so violent? Why has, why has mankind become so, so cruel to one another? How do we get to be so immoral? How, why, how come there's so much poverty? Why are there all, all these wars? And, you know, John Lennon of my generation, a little before maybe, wrote the immortal song in the pop rock culture, Imagine All the People. Imagine All the People. It's really a pretty song. Imagine all the people. It's easy if you try. No heaven above us, only sky. Imagine all the people living as one. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I, and it's a beautiful song, but you know what's wrong with that song? It's all about imagination. It's all about imagination. Man, I love that. And you know what? He doesn't even realize he is actually prophesying the kingdom of God. He is actually prophesying what life is as a child of God. We can have peace and we can have some great, but when we get to heaven, there it will be like that. In fact, even when Christ comes and reigns, in the New Jerusalem at the end of Revelation, in the tribulation. Well, that's another message. But my point is, he still left it open. Wouldn't you just, wouldn't you like to have that? Yeah, and so we're just all going to ride around. Now, I grew up in the hippie generation. I wore the, well, with a limitation because dad, you know, I know, I mean, I wore those platform shoes, four hole belt. I mean, in fact, I think some of that's coming back a little bit now. But my mom, mom, mom and dad kept me in check pretty much, didn't they, darling? Yeah, yeah. Now, she was a hippie, but I wasn't, so that's, I rescued her from the hippie element. But those poor folks were always running around dreaming for peace, love, not war. And they all ended up becoming politicians, and most of them are running the country now. That's just just the facts. Well, the world's trying to answer those questions, and they try. Here's here's some of the answers the world. Well, it's the fault of the educational system. We got too much pressure on the kids, so we need to take away absolutes. We need to take away... Awards, and we need to make everybody equal. Or it's poverty, so we need to spend more money. 
The world says, man, we've got to spend more money, and we've got to give everybody a nice home, and we've got to give them a good income. And, all, and, and, and that has been tried and tried and tried, and I promise you it will fail, and it will fail, and it will fail because it's never worked, and it never will. But the Bible only gives one answer. Say, Brother Mark, what is the answer to the mess we're in? And I know you've heard it. I know you've heard your preacher preach it. You've heard evangelists preach it. And you've had missionaries come in here and say, this is the problem of where we're at. But the answer is still the same. We got where we are because of sin. And it will never change. Sin is opposition to God. I will become like God, Lucifer said. And I will do what I want to do. And I'll be where I want to be. And I'll live the way I want to live. And you can. Go ahead. And you'll end up where millions have ended up. Go back to the Garden of Eden and study once again the fall of Adam and Eve, if you haven't, in a long time. (laughs) In fact, I was outside the other day, and I was thinking about this message in my home, and I was working, and, uh, and there were some weeds coming up in my garden, and I didn't like that. And immediately I thought, you know, this is your fault, Adam, Eve. The reason I got weeds in my garden, and the reason I got to keep plucking them up and trying to keep them out of there is because sin. Because that's what God said. God said the day that you sin, he said, man, the world is going to be cursed. I'm still trying to figure out how the mosquito got on the ark. I haven't figured that one out yet, okay? Maybe he's for our good, I don't know. That's the reason that, that, that ladies, when you, you that have children, you, you had pain. In other words, the reason we have disease and sickness and poverty and school shootings by the mass and, and, and all of this confusion of genders and all this, and I'm not talking, I'm just saying there's a lot of confusion, there's a lot of hurt. And the reason is because God said, you went away from my way. Now, here's the question, <clears throat> and I'll wrap this up here. How can we get out of the mess? <clears throat> how can we get out of the mess? You know, how do we get started? Well, God started it, and God says if we'll take and get out of the sinful conditions of our hearts and our lives, <clears throat> things will get better. But how are we going to get out of this? Well, again, the world tries to figure it out. What can we do to solve these problems that we have in our world? Gun control will do it. That's it. We'll do gun control. Or we'll just solve the unemployment problem, and we'll just take care of everybody. I mean, I know you young people are hearing this, and I know a lot of people are saying, and maybe some of you believe this. And, I, and listen, I'm not, I'm not trying to be so callous that I'm not saying that we couldn't try to do better with things, guns, and education. I'm not saying not to be caring and considerate and, 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 and intelligent about it, but we, it is not the answer. You could take away all the guns in the world and it wouldn't solve the problem of man's wanting to be violent. You could give all the money to everybody you wanted and there still would be a problem. You could take and pay for everybody's education and life and there still would be an unfulfilled because you, see, you know why there's going to be an unfulfillment? Because God created us And I used to sing a song years ago, there's a room in your heart that's reserved for Jesus. It's a vacancy that only he can fill. You can try to fill it up with this world and its many pleasures, but I tell you, my friend, you'll find there's something missing still. You know, I'm a preacher's kid. I'm a human. I don't say I was a rebellious preacher's kid, but I grew up in the church, and I grew up as a teenager, and I grew up even in my adult life, and there's been times I struggled. I struggled with, you know, I'm tired of this and that, and I think I want to do what I want to do. And, and sometimes I would venture over thinking, you know, this, <clears throat> without God's permission, without God's help, maybe this, will, maybe this will make me happy. Maybe this will fulfill me. You know what I've learned? I've learned nothing outside of God ever satisfies. Nothing. Being saved, born again, being a part of a good fellowship of believers, letting God speak to you through the messages and through the ministries and through all the activities. The reason you do all this is to motivate you to say, man, I'm going to find what God wants me to do right here in Paris, Texas, or somewhere. The Bible says, no, you you can't, all these things aren't going to solve the problem. 
And here's what the Bible teaches. It's not going to change anything until we have been changed inside. And that's what 1 John 5 is about. And this is the record, God says. <clears throat> when you believe on my son, and when you accept him into your life, now, now you're on the right track. Now, it doesn't mean it's always going to be easy because you're still in the human flesh. But you've done the first certain thing that's going to give you a good life. I always say this to everybody, especially young people right now, as you're getting ready to finish school, high school, college, man, make sure you ask God, God, now where do you want? Where do you want me to live? Where do you want me to go? I remember one time there, my first car was a 1962 Ford Galaxy 500, big boat, maroon. It was a nice car. And I spotted a little 68 two-door Plymouth Barracuda hardtop, and I told my dad, I said, Dad, I think God wants me to have that Barracuda. I think I could be really a witness for him with the other young people. Um, well, not quite like that, but he was good enough to help me get it because I'd save some money up for it. But at the same time, it's amazing how we'll want to spiritualize. Boy, if I could just have that. No, if I, Lord, if you'll fix this the way I want it, if you'll give me what I need, I could be a servant. No, the way God says, it's just like, it's like young Samuel. God called on young Samuel, and Samuel said, Lord, here am I. What do you want? And young people, adults, my point is life begins to become more certain after we're saved is when we say, God, now what do you want to do with my life? And you know, you got to be ready because he might put something on your heart or bring somebody across your path to introduce you to another field or another place, and you'll go, no! I shouldn't even say this, but I'm going to say it. I've always had a phobia God's going to call me to a big city. I, just, I like to visit big cities. All that traffic. My brother-in-law pastors out near Denver, and, and, and it goes right by uh, Invesco Field where, the, where the, the Broncos play, and the traffic is six lanes on both sides, and they're always creeping along like ants and bugs. I said, if I was there, I would lose my mind. But then God says, you better be careful. Because my grace is sufficient for you wherever you go. And I said, Lord, if you want me here, or a town like this, but God, please, let me just stay in small town America. Let me just go visit. My point is, God may want you to be somewhere. He's got to be careful. Listen, it's not until God gets in our heart, and then our minds are changed, and our wills and emotions are changed, and refashioned to the image of Christ. That's the most important thing. In other words, make sure you know you're saved and then realize after you're saved, now it's up to God. You know, what, you, know what's, you know what happens when God is not in control and you're not certain God is your Savior or God's in control? Your emotions do run. Emotions run things. I wish I could remember. I shared something with my wife this morning because I'm a, I'm a passionate guy. I'm confessing to you. You know, I, I don't have road rage as bad as I used to, but man, when they pull out in front of you stuff and all this kind of thing, you know, it's hard to sing what a friend we have in Jesus, you know? It's hard to sing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. I want to go, you shall re reap the root. I want to get into a preaching mode at them, you know? But, uh, but I, I, something about, I, I saw this little statement this morning on Facebook, and it said something about uh, before you put your emotions in gear, make sure you check your intelligence or something like that. And I had to confess to her. You know, I said, man, you're at the place where you confess to your wives or wives to your husband. You know, I said, oh, Darla, okay, because I just kind of lost my temper about something the other day. And I said, well, here's a good one for me. I'm going to confess. I need this. Pray. I do. I want more. In I want God's intelligence to control me more than my emotions, whatever those emotions are. Moral, anger, lust. You see, if God is not certain in your life, and if his salvation and his message is not certain in your life, you're going to run your life. And here's the beautiful thing. It don't matter what you've done, where you've been, or your condition. I found this story. There was a preacher by the name of Cocorius tells about, he's, he's kind of a, he's kind of a inner city uh, minister, and he's conducting a rap session with high school teenagers and in this one session, one girl asked, she said, the Bible says God loves everybody. Then it says that God sends people to hell. How can a loving God do that? And so Kokoria said, I gave her my answer, and she came back to me with arguments. I answered her arguments, and she responded to my answers. I did not convince her, nor did she convince me. Soon the session was over, and we both were pretty angry. 
And here's what a Christian does. Afterwards, I approached her and said, I owe you an apology. I really should not have allowed our discussion to become so arg uh, argumentative. That's kind of what I was talking about, the, the Facebook, ar the arguments, Christians. And then I asked, may I share something with you to her? And she said, yes. So I took her through a basic presentation of the gospel, Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now listen to this. It was then that this high school senior began to weep and she told me she had been having an affair with a married man and the reason she did not believe in hell or God or the Bible was because in her heart she knew she was sinning. Now I'm not judging anybody, but I'm speaking to me. When I went, when in my life, when I had not been right with God, the last thing I wanted to do was go to church. When I had not been right with God, the last thing I wanted to do was read my Bible. When I was not right with God, the last thing I wanted to do was have any spiritual convictions. Because you know why? Because that Bible and the Holy Spirit and the Spirit that God puts in all people as far as, as, far as living, I'm not talking about salvation, they know they're sinning against their Creator. And that's why one of the reasons we have so much violent anger. I mean, I'm even hearing so-called Christians, I forgive me for being judgmental a little bit, but, they're, but they're, they're so angry. And they're fine. Listen, God didn't send us. I know, well, the Bible says I send you with a sword. Yeah, and this is the sword right here. More than anything, the sword of the Lord. The Bible says it's as sharp as a two-edged sword. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that maybe in your life today, the reason that you're starting, maybe, maybe you're saved or maybe you're not saved or maybe you're, maybe you're starting, well, you're just, you're just, you don't, you're mad at the church, you're mad at God, and you're mad at the preacher, and you're mad at Christians. Maybe there's something in your life that God is convicting you about through his Holy Spirit. And this just doesn't happen with young people. I've seen adults. I've been in this long enough. I've seen, I've seen officers of churches become this way. I've seen preachers become this way. I've seen Christians become this way. Well, she went on and she wept, and uh, her conscience condemned her. But rather than face her guilt, she simply denied any future judgment or future hell. And that's, he says, that's what people do. I don't, I'm just going to believe in God. I'm not going to believe in a future punishment. So I'm just not going to believe it. That's not going to change it. Now, let me tell you something. This is from Mark Bailey, and I'm wrapping this up. This is from Mark Bailey, the preacher's kid, the preacher the dad, the grandpa, nothing, nothing great. I'm just like you. Cut me, I bleed. Despite of what the world says, the Bible says that when we finish this life, if Jesus is not our Savior and our Lord, we will not have the promise of life eternal with him. And can I also throw this in there? Not only do we not have the promise, if Jesus is not your Savior this morning, not only do you not have the promise of life eternal, you're going to have a miserable life while you're here. Can I go back to one of my earlier statements? The true test of true spiritual maturity as a Christian is when you have great joy at the bottom of life as you do at the top of life. When I was growing up, I used to hear preachers often say when things were rough, and I grew up around some preachers that were... I mean, it, it, was, it, was, it was a pioneering time where I, a lot of, my dad was a church planner. A lot of churches, a lot of, a lot of pastors that were like my dad, they were, they, were, they were home mission planners in America. They'd find towns and cities that didn't have a good evangelical or fundamental church or Baptist church. And there's, by the way, there's lots of them still in America, especially out west where I go. Towns of 35, 40,000 people have no Bible-believing church. Can you believe that in America? Thank God for foreign missions, and I know you're a mission-minded church, but can I just ask you to pray for America? Because we need preachers, and we need men and women to go sometimes to these towns, and they need to hear the message of the gospel. But you know, the thing about it is this. If you don't have Jesus Christ as your Savior, not only will you miss heaven, but you'll have a miserable life. There's no middle ground. There's no middle ground. You know, I said that, that Jesus is so ready to, to use you. I love this story, and this is what I close with. Tony Campalo, many of you have heard of him, recalls a deeply moving 
incident that happened during junior high week at a Christian camp. By the way, you got some kids at camp this week. Pray for those kids at camp and the camp people. Camp's great. Man, I was a camp kid and spoke at camps. Now listen, to this. even though this was a Christian camp, many of the campers were not Christians, and that's probably, that's one of the reasons you have youth camps is to try to get people to go to camps so they'll find Jesus, especially young boys, young girls, teenagers. Well, he recalls this moving incident that happened during a junior high week at a Christian camp. Even though this was a, a Christian camp, many of the campers are not Christians, and they treated another one of the campers, a boy with what, who had what's called spastic paralysis. And that's basically he had no control of his muscles. You've seen it. Maybe you know someone, and I'm making, but they, 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 have, they have no control. One of my favorite evangelists, and I don't, I don't think he, I think he had muscular dystrophy, it wasn't, but was David Ring. I, I was, anybody ever heard of David Ring, one of the most amazing uh, miracles of God and God used, and he preached. He just, he, but he had no, he, he had limited control of his facial muscles. Well, anyway, they started making fun of this young man at this camp with heartless ridicule. And sometimes during a Bible lesson or a camp lesson, he would ask a question. The boys would deliberately answer it and mock him, mimicking the way he, he moved and and one night, his, his, his cabin group, and we did this often, we had devotions before bedtime, his cabin group chose to lead the devotions before some other campers, and it was one more effort on their part to have some fun at his expense. And unashamedly, he, he saw this. Now, again, this young boy, although he has, in tru- he has trouble controlling his feet and his muscles and his contortions, he's intelligent. And he stood up in his, in his most spastic, rigid way, and he, he, ex- he exclaimed as loud as he could, Jesus loves me, and I love Jesus. And the camp group went silent. You know, what that, you know what did that? The power of God through the certainty of a human being who was less, less than perfect. See, here's what we forgot. We need to give our best, you know, I... Sometimes I wear a tie, sometimes I don't wear a tie. The Bible says just make sure you're dressed modestly. I guess I could have, sometimes I wear my, my I should have worn my cowboy boots and jeans today since I'm in Texas. I like to do that sometimes. In fact, I I go up west, I do a program called Mark Goes West, and I like, I get to put on my hat and put on my bolo tie, and I'm a real singing cowboy. But you know what? It don't matter. Here's my point. Here's my point. As, as beautiful as this sanctuary is and many sanctuaries I'm in and as, as organized as you can get it and as, and as much funds as you can raise and as many activities you can have, nothing will ever replace the one person who has that certainty in his eye and that, that, that snap in his step. I know Jesus loves me and I love him. And I'm going to serve him no matter what. That is what we can be sure of. Now, here's the thing. Once you get that down, you better look out because that, opened up, that opens up a whole lot of other doors of what we call blessings from the Almighty. When God says, all right, I see it. Now you're talking. Maybe your life's limited right now. Let me tell you what happened. This boy, this boy, as I said, did this, and all of a sudden nobody laughed. There was absolute silence. Only the sound of some of the boys starting to cry. And something wonderful happened in the hearts of the campers that week. And revival broke out. And young people got right. And young people got rid of sin. And young people got saved. All because of one spastic boy with paralysis of the facial muscles and the legs. And and he'd been made fun of. But finally in certainty he said what those well-bodied probably young, well-built athletes couldn't say, even to their youth group, I love Jesus, and Jesus loves me. Amen? That's what, see, that's what God wants. Now, I, I want to ask you a question, and I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to have a song. I've been asking this question for 45 years, and I'll keep asking it. Is Jesus your Savior today?